I'd like to start by giving my thanks to the College of de France, to Professor de Roche and Michael Marx, and also to uh, you in the audience. Thank you very much for coming. Um, many ancient manuscripts have come to reside in public and private collections as fragments of varying sizes from what were originally complete books. Often one can find pages from the same original manuscript separated and residing in different collections in various countries and even across continents. Through the cooperation of institutions like national libraries, universities, archives, and museums, digital technologies now make it possible to reunite these dispersed pages online in a virtual way. This enables researchers to examine high definition images of the manuscript pages online and in order as if the complete manuscript were physically reassembled in one place. Our project, which we are calling the Digital Mus'haf, is the first attempt to reunite pages of a dispersed ancient Quran manuscript in an online digital version, version which will be accessed through an internet portal sponsored by the Bodleian Library of Oxford University. Mus'haf is the Arabic word for a manuscript in codex format. The manuscript chosen is one that resided in Fustat prior to the 17th century, and from there came to be dispersed into at least 10 different collections on four continents during the 17th through the 20th centuries. It is a manuscript with a particularly beautiful script, which came to be one of the most prominent script styles for luxury Qurans during the height of the Abbasid era, in the 800s and 900s of the Common Era. Our project is a pilot project reuniting 170 pages, or 85 folios, from four collections. The Bibliothèque Nationale, the Bodleian Library, the Chester Beatty Library in Dublin, and the August Herzog Bibliothek in Wolfenbüttel, Germany. Being able to view a complete manuscript, or as much of it that survives, allows scholars to get a holistic view of the manuscript and to answer questions that cannot be answered by looking at just a few folios. For instance, one can see if there are signs that more than one scribe were involved in the production of the manuscript. Also, one can trace important grammatical features uh, throughout the entire manuscript and place it in a historical context of development, in the development of the um, of early Arabic grammar. One can also trace artistic features in, uh, in uh, the early historical development of Quranic illumination. One other feature, uh, the pattern, when folios are put in order, the pattern of hair side and flesh side use of the parchment can be traced, giving a strong indication of the original pattern of the gathering of the folios into choirs so that the original structure of the codex can be discerned. These are just a few of the questions that can be addressed with a reunited codex. Now you might wonder how we came to our idea. Many of the best scholarly ideas happen over croissants and chocolat. My Bodleian Library colleague, uh, Alistair Watson, curator of Islamic manuscripts, and I were in a cafe discussing the library's Quran manuscript collection and Alistair mentioned how some of our fragments are part of a Quran that also has fragments found in other collections. He mentioned two journal articles that list these dispersed Quran portions. And it reminded me of recent work that was done on the New Testament Codex Sinaiticus, this particular manuscript. A fourth century Greek Bible dispersed to four locations that has recently been digitally reunited. Its surviving portions are in four locations, London, St. Petersburg, Vienna, and St. Catherine's Monastery in the Southern Sinai Peninsula. Now, because of historical sensitivities over ownership questions with this manuscript, there was a serious round of negotiations between governments, the Greek Orthodox Church, and the libraries where the manuscript portions are housed. But for the sake of scholarship, the ownership questions were set to the side and the parties agreed to an international project hosted by the British Library to digitize all surviving portions of the manuscript and to make it available online for free to the world. 
The result is a spectacular website that is being used by scholars and non-specialists from around the world. Now, Alistair also remembered that the British Library had digitally reunited a spectacular manuscript of a Hindu epic poem called the Ramayana. And the thought occurred to us, could we do this same kind of a thing for a Quran manuscript using one of the manuscripts in our collection? Now, we didn't have the resources available to us that the British Library did, but could there be a way that we could, on a smaller budget, with fewer resources, do something similar? Well, thankfully, our manuscript did not seem to have controversial ownership questions. And though it's a relatively early Quran manuscript and a beautiful at one at that, it is a more modest manuscript, um, not requiring quite the same level of resources. We outlined a manageable pilot proof of concept project, submitted a proposal to the Islamic Manuscript Association, and they kindly granted funding for a one-year project. With this, we've also received significant institutional support from Oxford University's Computer and Information Services, who've helped us with many of the technical aspects of building and hosting the website. Two things about our project stand out to us. One is that it uses technology that is currently available to make digital projects like this a normal research tool for lesser known manuscripts like the one we have chosen. It's not inventing new software or technologies. Also, instead of just the spectacular showpiece manuscripts getting this kind of treatment, the technology is in place that with more reasonable budgets, smaller staffs, and with less expensive technical needs, the same result can be obtained of digitally reuniting other lesser known manuscripts which may have other significant research value. The second significant thing about our project is that to our knowledge, this is the first ever attempt of an online digital reunification project for a dispersed Quran manuscript. Well, let me talk about the manuscript. The manuscript does not have a name for all of its fragments, so we are simply calling it DM1 for Digital Mus'haf 1. It's a manuscript that is very representative of the mainstream of surviving luxury Quranic parchment manuscripts from Islam's early centuries. Its script style has the technical designation D1, according to Professor DeRoche's system. Here's just uh, one of the more spectacular pages of it. This page is in the Bibliothèque Nationale's collection. Um, it is perhaps the most majestic script style for Qurans developed during the height of the Abbasid era in the 9th and the 10th centuries of the Common Era. It was used across the Muslim world during this period. Examples have been found in all four of the historic Quran repositories in the Muslim world, in Cairo and Tunisia, in Damascus, and their manuscripts now residing in Istanbul, in Cairo, in Sana, Yemen. The script style was also in use for a long time, at least 130 years during the 9th and 10th centuries. It was a script style used especially for luxurious Qurans commissioned as pious gifts for mosques multi-volume Qurans of extraordinary expense and effort. These Qurans are notable for the few lines they have per page. Ours has only five, with letters and words precisely and beautifully measured and elongated on the page. With only five lines per page, originally this codex had more than 2,750 folios but only about 12% of these survive, just 344 are known. All 2,750 would have originally been bound into perhaps 30 volumes. Unfortunately, no notice survives as to if this was commissioned to be a donation to a mosque, nor is there a colophon telling us about the scribe and the precise date of its composition. In addition to the script style, this manuscript is notable in its use of colored dots. 
The colored dots in the Bodleian's portion have been the subject of two journal articles. Now, there are no surviving manuals that explain the precise use of these dots, so they need to be analyzed for their uses and their uses deciphered in retrospect. Uh, one scholar, a gentleman named Yassine Dutton, discerned that the red dots in the Bodleian portion uh, are used as patterns for the Arabic short vowels. This seems to be an, a common practice. The green dots are used for six different purposes, most of them related to noting the position of alternative ways of reciting the Quran at, at the particular places where those green dots are located. Um, one could even say that these are noting places of textual variation or textual variance. But there are also uses of the green dots that seem to be related to pronunciation issues of the text. And the gold dots note more textual variants. A survey of the uses of these dots throughout the entire manuscript or this entire surviving portion of the manuscript is a task yet to be done. Let me just show you on the second line from the bottom, you'll see the green dots and a gold dot, just as an example. Concerning illumination, gold leaf is used in this manuscript for surah headings, the beginnings of individual chapters of the Quran. This is one spectacular example in the Bibliothèque Nationale's collection. This one is from the Chester Beatty Library collection. And this one is in the Bodleians. <coughs> um, and it's one thing interesting about this, this one appears to be incomplete, that uh, it wasn't yet finished. You can see in the box, it's not completely filled in compared to these other two. And it may suggest that um, this manuscript may not have been completed in its illuminations at the time it went out of use. Gold leaf was also used to mark reader's aids, like the various divisions of verses. On this page, we have single verse markers with the little gold roundels, and a five verse marker with the gold letter ha on the second line from the bottom, and then also 10 verse markers with the large roundel on the bottom line. This manuscript also has places of, prost of prostration marked with gold roundels in the margins. <clears throat> Concerning its provenance, its place of origin is uh, unknown. It possibly spent a long amount of time in the library at the Amr Mosque. We can legit and it may have been one of the original 250 that Professor DeRoche mentioned. We can legitimately surmise that it was from there that over at least two centuries and through various buyers, it eventually came to reside in the collections where the pages are now found. There is very limited information as to how the pages came into their current respective collections. The Dutch scholar, Jacobus Golius, is a common thread for at least two collections the Herzog August Bibliothek and the Bodleian Libraries. Sometime before 1667, the Duke August received the pages in their collection as a gift for his library from Golius in order for Golius to obtain a license to copy a different text. This is perhaps the earliest record of pages from this codex existing outside of Egypt. The Bodleian's pages were acquired in 1714 through the purchase of a collection upon the death of an Irish Anglican archbishop who was a scholar collector by the name of Narcissus Marsh. And this was the sale catalog. And number one is the listing of it in the sale catalog. And that's Narcissus Marsh. Um, he purchased them in 1695. Uh, in a sale of Jacobus Golius's private manuscripts. The Bibliothèque Nationales came in from the collection of Asselin de Cherville in 1822. The Chester Baby Library in Dublin probably acquired their folios 
through a private purchase sometime around 1929. And their part of the codex contains perhaps the most spectacular illuminated pages that have survived out of any of the existing folios. There are six other libraries known that hold portions of this Quran, the Freer Gallery of the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, DC, the Royal Library in Copenhagen, Denmark, the Gotha State Library in Gotha, Germany, the Museum for Islamische Kunst in Berlin, and the Topkapi Sarai and the Hagia Sophia Libraries in Istanbul. It's hoped that the portions held in these collections will be included in the next stage of this project. And these are the four locations in the current project, involved in the current project. Now just some technical information. Another distinctive aspect of this project is that instead of gathering images of all the manuscripts in one place and then just putting them online on, on one website, we are linking the institutions themselves, linking their image collections in their libraries in cyberspace to what is called a shared canvas. The software that enables this is called IIIF, which stands for International Image Interoperability Framework. What that means is that this framework provides a platform that takes the different and often previously incompatible kinds of software that collections already use to store and display their digital images and it enables them to work together with other software that allows co the computer user to access, view, and manipulate the images. For researchers, this will allow a seamless experience to view pictures of these pages in high definition, to zoom in on details needing more precise study, and to even save images to an online research file and perhaps even download low definition images for their own personal research use. All of this preserves the full ownership rights of the institutions involved while making access to the manuscript images much easier and also flexible enough to be done on the growing variety of digital devices like tablets and mobile phones. Already, millions of images are available through IIIF linked institutions. And the, and the potential is almost limitless globally as more institutions join the system. Uh, here's a partial list of institutions that are already involved and more are joining all the time. There are at least 120 involved at, at uh, the moment. For national libraries, you have the Bibliothèque Nationale, the British Library, and the National Libraries of Denmark, Egypt, Israel, New Zealand, Norway, Poland, Serbia, and Wales. And then you have these research institutes and universities uh, involved. Just some concluding thoughts. As a scholar, it's a joy to be able to study objects like these, which display such beauty and skill, not to mention their antiquity, their rarity, and their inherent value. It's quite a privilege. It also gives great pleasure to be able to share them widely in a meaningful way, to make them accessible. With a symposium like this today, as scholars and enthusiasts for our, our respective disciplines, I think we'd like to excite you with the potentials we see for exploring the past and gaining the insights and information that can be gleaned from these beautiful artifacts that we get to work with. I hope I've been able to do that in some small measure with sharing the potential for digitally reunifying Quran manuscripts. For the academic realm, the potentials of this technology excite me as more institutions choose to become IIIF compliant. There can be increased awareness and use of well-known and lesser-known manuscripts. 
There can be possible links between existing and future Quran manuscript projects and databases. There can be greater ease for researchers to access existing Quran manuscripts without having to travel for their initial and continuing research. And then there is the new information that will be generated as more manuscripts are digitally reunited and studied, which will contribute to our understanding of so many aspects of the Quran manuscript tradition. For example, we'll gain a much more thorough understanding of scribal practices, of book construction, of the historical development of Arabic orthography and grammar, of the use of these systems of colored dots, of the recitation systems behind them and their relation to the written tradition of the Quran's texts. And this is just to name a few. These manuscripts give us a window into a period of use of the Quran that in many ways is very different than how the Quran is used today. It was a time when there was an allowed degree of flexibility in the ways the Quran could be recited and written. And these technologies, these digital technologies, can help us better explore what differences and similarities there are between our two eras. The digital Mus'haf portal is set to go online at the end of July. Here is what it will look like. Um, by clicking on the various buttons, you'll be able to go through the manuscript uh, page by page. You'll be able to um, set up your own online area to save images that you have copied from pages you're studying in the manuscript. We hope to add other manuscripts to this portal as well in due time. And there will also be various uh, articles and metadata added as well that you can access. I invite you to visit and use it when it's up and running. Thank you very much.